So let's do, so let's talk about modeling and dynamic behavior of DC sources useful for grid forming inverter and other application renewable energy systems. That's the way to say I am from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. Um, before to start our conversation, I would like to talk a little bit about University of Puerto Rico because it's a good opportunity to show what we have in Puerto Rico. And also you will know what is our institution. Many, for some of you, is the first time that you are hearing about the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West. So I will talk a little bit about that. Maybe you hear about Puerto Rico, about the hurricanes that strike our island from Fiona, Maria, and other more, but we are more than hurricanes in the Caribbean. Actually, let me tell you a little bit some relevant facts about Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was discovered in the year 1493 by Christopher Columbus. Puerto Rico was a Spanish colony between 1493 to 1898, but then after the Hispanic American War in 1898, Puerto Rico was claimed as a US territory. The official languages of Puerto Rico are both Spanish and English. Since 1898, Puerto Rico is a US territory and all the Puerto Ricans are US citizens since 1919. The University of Puerto Rico is a land grant university established in the year 1908. The University of Puerto Rico, we have 11 campuses. University of Puerto Rico, Maya West is in the west coast of Puerto Rico. You see the map, we are in the west coast of Puerto Rico. And the University of Puerto Rico have around 65,000 students in those 11 campuses. Uh, our second biggest one is the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West, that we have around 12,000 students. UPNN is the is well known for the excellence in engineering and science. Around 40% of our undergraduate and 32% of our graduate students are females. And that's an important number, especially that are minorities and Hispanic. So it's an added value. And our Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering have 30 faculty members and nearly 1,200 students in electrical and computer engineering. And our program in electrical and computer engineering is a five-year engineering program divided in six different areas. So for UPRM, uh -huh. we have a team in the area of power system and energy group that is one of the groups that I belong, that we have one female professor, eight male professor, over 300 power engineering students, a good infrastructure and good funding for research. And we have a lot of partnership with top universities, industry and national laboratories in the US. And we are electric energy experts in Puerto Rico. We have our research is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Education, and others like the industry affiliated programs and other groups. We have several labs in our institution. This is the lab that I manage that is called the Smart Power Electronics and Aerospace Research Laboratory, where in this lab, we train graduate students and undergraduate students. They have the opportunity to use test benches power hardware in the loop from Opal, power amplifier, fuel cells, chroma PV emulators, Opal RT real-time simulators. We have available lat pulse inverter, diristor, AC power, solar panels, among others. So the students have the opportunity to have not only a theoretical experience in the air of energy system, but also hands-on experience. Additionally, we have another lab that is led by my colleague, Dr. Fabio Andrade, that is the microgrid laboratory. Those two labs are dedicated in the area of microgrid and renewable energy system. This one is more focused in the area of simulation of energy system, where we have Opal RTs, we have the space system, we have different type of inverters and converters. And the idea is that we can emulate system in the area of power system using those kind of devices that we have in the microgrid laboratory. Some examples of our current projects at UPRM, this project, I am the leader of those projects. One of them is the hardware in the loop for cyber physical power system. We have other projects that is the use of rural power design and energy storage, especially this project we started after the different hurricane like Maria, Fiona, that was sponsored and is sponsored by FEMA. Other projects that we are using are projects related to the unified consortium in the of grid forming inverter that we are working the characterization of renewable energy sources. And that's something that we will be talking today about the characterization of PV, fuel cells, and other type of devices. And additionally, the K-16 engineering education in energy system that is a project that is sponsored by Unify and also the consortium hybrid renewable energy system. The idea is to train 
the student, not only at the undergraduate level, but when they are in the high school, when they are in the intermediate school, when they are in the elementary school, to attract them in the area of energy system, to attract them to the engineering, not to wait when they have 18 years old, no, to attract them at the age of eight years old, nine years old, to show them what is a solar panel, what is a battery, and they can do some kinds of experiments. Another project that we have, and we are proud of that, was the Oasis de Luz. This is a project that we developed in the island of Puerto Rico in several rural communities, especially after the disaster of the different hurricanes like Maria, Fiona, and others. We went and we established those systems that are solar panels with inverters, small refrigerators, so the people, they can charge their cell phone, they can put their medicine in the fridge and other things, and they can have electricity. When the hurricane destroyed the island of Puerto Rico, like Maria, we didn't have electricity for several weeks. And this was the kind of project that was helping our local community. But now let's talk about solar panels, fuel cells, thermoelectric generators, more, the different kind of models and the intention that we came for this seminar. So we have a, a motivation. During the 2023, the Unified Summer Meeting at Orlando, Florida, there was a key question that one of the US representatives did to Dr. Wade Drew from Pacific Northern and the rest of the Unified members. And the question was, what happens on the DC side before the grid forming inverters? So that was a very relevant and important question, not only to analyze after, but also to consider before. And that's one of the reasons that I say, hey, we have been established and working in several models at UPRM, so why not to consider those models as to use it as part of this kind of analysis and at the same time to present different models of DC power sources. So in many cases, many researchers consider photovoltaic fuel cells, thermoelectric generator sources as constant current sources and batteries are treated as a stable DC source, but the reality is very different from those assumptions. For example, a PV model should be considered as a limited DC power source with containment boundary effects. For example, the radiance level, the temperature, those change the behavior of a solar panel. And at the same time, if we consider especially software that can handle the simulation power system, but not necessarily all commercial research and academic institutions have the same program, the same software or identical versions. So it's important to develop some of the models that we can use and at the same time, we can analyze not only with the industry or with the national lab, but also with our academic institutions. After all, the idea is that we can do some research in the area. So answering some of the question, what happened before the DC side of the grid forming inverter, there are some problems on the DC side. Well, we can have voltage instability, as it's a significant concern on the DC side. Voltage fluctuation could occur due to various factors, including changes in the low demand and variations in renewable energy generation. So at UPRN, we propose several potential solutions. One of them is the capacity to provide tools and equipment to simulate and emulate the behavior of a renewable energy system, like a solar panel, like a fuel cell, like a thermoelectric generator. And at the same time, to develop current dynamic models that could be useful in this case for grid forming inverter and other type of applications related to microgrid and energy system. So when we are talking about our mathematical models of DC power sources developed by the UPRM for microgrid and reforming application. What we are talking is about a model of fuel cells, model for solar panels, and a model for the thermoelectric generator. And we will be discussing those models here in this presentation and the use and how we can use the manufacturer data sheet to emulate the behavior of those kind of DC power sources. Let's start with our first model. This is the photovoltaic exponential model. So when we look at the typical PV manufacturer data sheet, this is the information that the manufacturer will give it to you when you buy a solar panel. You will have the IV curve and those IV curve will be maybe at different temperatures, but not necessarily will be the temperature that you need, actually the temperature that will be, will be most of the time 25 centigraders and the radiance level of 1000 watt per meter square that it's called the standard test conditions. Additionally, the manufacturer data sheet will give you the maximum power, the short circuit current, the open circuit voltage 
under a standard test condition. If you have the good luck, then the manufacturer will give you additional information. That information will be probably the temperature coefficient for the short circuit current and the temperature coefficient for the open circuit voltage. That is the type of information that you will have it from the manufacturer data sheet and considering the electrical characteristic. It's important to understand that maybe the manufacturers, they will comply with the standard UL 1703 that is required that this information will give you on their nominal rating at the standard test condition. As I mentioned before, 100. 1,000 watt per meter square, 25 centigrade, and an air mass of 1.5. At the same time, if the manufacturer will give you another information, will be the nominal operating cell of the temperature that is usually around 800 watt per meter square, 20 centigrade, and a wind speed of one per meter squared. That is information that the manufacturer will give you, but we need to develop some models or at least that we can use that information provided by the manufacturer that achieved. Yes, maybe you will say, oh, but there are other labs like the Sandia PV uh, model, or there are other models for solar panel. But here the question it is that we wanted to develop an expedite model for solar panel that we can use and we can develop and to use it to analyze the behavior of a solar panels using the manufacturer data sheet. In this case, we propose the PB exponential model. This model, we have been working at UPRN this summer during the 2023. We were at Sandia National Laboratories in the Photovoltaic System Evaluation Laboratory, validating this model using different types of solar panels and data provided by Sandia National Lab. And equation number one is the equation that describes the current as a function of the short circuit current, that is IX, the value of the voltage V as an entrance, the value of the voltage of the open circuit voltage Vx, and what we call a characteristic constant for the solar panel that it's called V. So using the optimal voltage, the optimal current, the short circuit current that it's called Ix, the open circuit voltage that is called Vx, we can substitute those values in the equation number four, we can calculate the characteristic constant B. We can use the characteristic constant B and the data provided by the manufacturer data sheet, like the optimal voltage, optimal current, open circuit voltage, short circuit current, and we can emulate the behavior of a solar panel more than that. We have a current as a function of the voltage, but if we multiply current by voltage, we have the power. If we have the voltage and we divide it by the current, we will have the impedance or the resistance for the solar panel. In this case, you can see the behavior of a solar panel just using the manufacturer data sheet. We put IX, the short circuit current, BX, the open circuit voltage. We calculate the characteristic constant of the solar panel. Again, it's just using the equation number four. Actually, this work was published the last summer of the IEEE a photovoltaic special, a specialist conference that was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So we presented there. And now we have the IBP relationship, PV relationship, and the impedance voltage relationship. So now we can emulate the behavior of a solar panel and at the same time, the IV curve, PV curve, but also other additional information that is not necessarily given by the manufacturer. That is, for example, the impedance versus the voltage or the conductance versus the voltage for a solar panel. And that's something very nice that you can obtain that information because for maximum power point tracking operations, now we can use and we can develop new algorithms considering not only the power of the ball, all the current, but also the impedance, the conductance, and that's something very nice. Actually, we can use the dynamic PV model for the exponential model, and we can add it for if we have more information. For example, when I developed this model, I extended not only I developed the equation number one, that is the relationship for the current as a function of the voltage, but also if I need to calculate the short circuit current for the solar panel as a function of the radiance level and the temperature, we have the equation number two. If you remember, I said at the beginning that if you have the good luck that the manufacturer will give you with the data sheet, the temperature 
the coefficient for the temperature of the short circuit current and the coefficient of the temperature for the open circuit voltage, you can add that information. So here in the equation number two, we can calculate the short circuit current. Additionally, in the equation number three, we can calculate the open circuit voltage as a function of the temperature and the radiance level. The radiance level, let's call it AI, and the temperature is T. And now we can see the behavior of those IB curve, this PV curve on their different temperature levels and radiance level. And at the same time, we can calculate again with equation number four, the characteristic constant for a solar panel. And if we need the dynamic behavior for a solar panel, and we wanted to use electrical circuit analysis, now we can use equation number five, that if you have, for example, your students and you want to teach them about solar panels, a model that you can use, you can use this type of model and to show them how to analyze a circuit using a solar panel. But maybe you have the question, yeah, but in the case of the solar panels, we understand that also we have what it's called the maximum power point. And we have what it's called maximum power point tracking technologies and strategies and algorithms. So at UPRN, we developed a method that it called the linear oriented coordinate method that we are able to estimate the optimal voltage that produce the maximum power as a function of the short circuit current, the characteristic constant that it's called B. And at the same time, we can calculate the optimal current that produce the maximum power. In this case, using the short circuit current and the characteristic constant, those are the question, the equation that you see in yellow. This linear oriented coordinate method is a non-traditional method that you can calculate the even solution for a function without the differentism property, in this case for the function of solar panel. This solution of the linear oriented coordinate method, we can use it at least to estimate that value of the optimal voltage. We cannot claim that you obtain the exact solution for the optimal voltage that produce the maximum value of the, of the power, but a solution sufficiently close to the maximum power, the solution sufficiently close to the optimal value of the voltage that produce the maximum power. For example, here we show an example of a solar panel that have a short circuit current one, uh, open circuit voltage of one volt, the optimal current of 0.85, the optimal voltage of 0.75. And we have this behavior using our model where we have the short circuit current, short circuit voltage, uh, short circuit current, open circuit voltage, optimal current, and optimal voltage. Now we can calculate the maximum power, the optimal voltage, and the optimal current. More than that, we can calculate the optimal impedance that produce the maximum power for this specific solar panel. We can use the equation that we have here if we wanted to develop the dynamic model of the system, we can see that behavior. You see that there are other models that you can calculate the shunt impedance and the series impedance. So here we're using these models. We can use it very simple, it's just, to take the inverse of the derivative of the current with respect to the voltage when it's zero, with respect to the voltage when it's the open circuit voltage, the negative, and you will have the, the series resistance and the shunt resistance. These values of these models we validated using experimental data and simulation. In this case, you can see for this solar panel, we use the software Simulink, Saber, PSPICE, and also we did physical measurement at different irradiance levels and at different temperatures. And the idea was to see how our solar panel will behave and how good is our model to emulate the behavior of the solar panel. Here you can see the experiment and you can see comparing with different types of software like Simulink, Saber, PSPICE, and our measured data. So something that is very nice is that you can use these models for the type of software that you're using. For example, if you're using PSPICE, well, now you can use it. If you're using Simulink, now you can use this kind of model and to include it as part of your toolboxes. 
Another thing that we have been working at UPRN with the modeling of solar panels is that we develop an additional model that it's called fractional polynomial model to emulate the behavior of the solar panel. A different of our previous model, that it's called the exponential model, here what we are using is the following equation number six, that the current is equal to the short circuit current minus the short circuit current multiplied by the voltage, where the voltage exists from zero to the open circuit voltage, divided by the open circuit voltage, everything elevated to the n plus q, where n is an integer value, one, two, three, four, five, and q is a value between zero and one, where q could be zero, but not could be one, it's just a value between zero and one. So here we're using this model, if we multiply the current by the voltage, we have the power more than that. If we take the derivative of the power with respect to the voltage, we can obtain in equation number eight, the optimal voltage that will produce the maximum power. More than that, if we substitute the optimal voltage in the equation number six, we can obtain the optimal current that will produce the maximum power. In other words, the equation number nine, if we multiply optimal current by optimal power, optimal current by optimal voltage, we will have the maximum power. And that equation for the maximum power is the equation number 10. In the equation number 11, what you will see here is a relationship with our previous model of the exponential model and this model that it's called the fractional polynomial model. Here, if you have the optimal voltage for a solar panel, the optimal, the open circuit, a voltage for a solar panel and you have the characteristic constant, then you can calculate the values of n plus q. I am showing at the right side a table with different types of solar panels, solar x, x10, solar x, x5, SLK60, N6, with the different values that we are able using this model to calculate. So we have from the manufacturer data sheet, the short circuit current, open circuit voltage, optimal values for the current and voltage, and we are able now to calculate the characteristic constant and the value of N and Q. More than that, if you see the IB curve between the fractional polynomial model and the exponential model, they overlap one over each other. And here you can see a difference in radiance level and a difference temperature. More than that, if I multiply the current by the voltage, I will have the power. So in the bottom, you can see the power with respect to the voltage. And if we calculate the relative error between our exponential model and our fractional polynomial model, the error is around 10 to the minus four. So it's very small error. That's something very nice. That's why you see this very this behavior. More than that, using data provided for Sandia National Laboratory as part of the unified consortium in this effort, I was able to use my model to compare with the data and to do a fit. And here you can see how very nice it is the IB curve, the PV curve, but more than that, the data that was provided to me was not the whole data, was just segments of data, but we are able to emulate the behavior of the whole solar panel. That's something very nice, not only the IB, PV curve, but also other information like impedance, versus voltage, like the conductance versus voltage, other information that we can use as part of this analysis to analyze the dynamic behavior for the solar panel. And that's very nice because if we're considering in power electronics, the behavior of a uniforming invertance system in the DC side, this information will be very useful for those kind of models. But we decided to go a step further in those models, not only to limit ourselves with data, but let's compare with simulators that are already commercially available. In this case, we are using a Chroma 62020H, that is a solar array simulator, this power supply. May so probably many of you have it in your labs here at UPRM. We have one of them that I have it in my lab that I use it. And here we can provide programmable IV curve simulation for fast analysis in the performance of MPTT. Our interest in this point was to compare the behavior of the chroma with our model and to see how good or how bad is working our system. 
So let's see some of the simulations. Here we are scaling an IB curve. We are using a Trina solar vertex of 600 watt with an efficiency of 21%. We are using that data from the manufacturer. We loaded the data in the chroma, and this is the behavior from the chroma, the IB curve and the PV curve. Well, now let's use our model in Madelab. We were able just to program here, just one of my undergraduate students did this code. Um, the idea we put it here and here, you can see the IB curve from the chroma, but also from our model. And you can see that one IB curve, the PV curve, they can match one to each other. So that's very nice because that means that our model is very good. Here we're comparing with a commercially available device that can emulate the behavior of a solar panel using our model. And we were just using the data provided by the manufacturer data sheet, and we were able to obtain very similar results. More than that, we can extend that analysis not only to limit ourselves to the IV curve or PV curve, but if we wanted to obtain the PV, the power versus the impedance, now we can obtain that curve, which is something very nice, especially if you wanted to do maximum power point tracking. Now you know which one is the optimal impedance that will produce the optimal power. We can extend the work to obtain the impedance versus the voltage, the conductance versus the voltage, or the power versus the voltage. Again, the good thing is that now you can have more information with this model than information that you have it before. And that just using the data sheet from the manufacturer. So that's something very nice. But at UPRM, we decided to go one step further, not only for terrestrial application, but also to use it for aerospace application here. My former student, currently Dr. Rachid Dalbali from Sandia National Laboratory, he tested the model, but now using satellite, specifically the photovoltaic exponential model we were using for a satellite under different angle inclination, because maybe you will say, ah, but if the solar panel is not necessarily 90 degrees from the sun, if I have a change of degree, how the behavior of the system. So here we were using for different type of inclinations and that will affect the gradients level as you can expect and that could change the pv the power versus voltage the current versus voltage for the solar panel and on the right side you can see the effect of the inclination angle in the power versus the voltage and the current versus the voltage more than that we tested in a small CubeSat that the University of Puerto Rico helped, the Inter-American University also in Puerto Rico, that they developed their own CubeSat around one year and a half ago. That was a PV interconnected in cascade with a CEPIC and ARLO. And here we did it for the validation of our hardware, in this case for the solar panel, where we have solar panel, DC-DC converters, battery storage, DC-DC converter, our load of five 3.3 volt and the control. And the CubeSat, just to mention, is a small satellite of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And here you can see that at different irradiance levels, we are able to obtain the behavior of the PV. You can see those IV curve and PV curve changing. Here, the solar panel was interconnected with the CEPI to our R load. And what we are doing here, we are changing under different irradiance level you can see the behavior of the current, how it's changing and how the SEPI is able to put the PV to satisfy the power that is required by the load, but at the same time, to keep that voltage under different irradiance level. Of course, this is possible if and only if the solar panel can provide the power that is required by the load. The good thing is that now you can see that for our system changing the different powers at different time, we are able to satisfy the current needs of the load and at the same time to keep that voltage for the load for this satellite. We extended the analysis using other software saver where we have the PV using a SETA converter and our load. In this case, the idea was to see how the current and the voltage will change with time when we are changing the load. And at the same time, the PV is forced to satisfy those changes in the load. And again, we are able to control the power of the solar panel that is transferred to their load using 
the set a converter. And here you can see the behavior of a system changing the load. We are able to satisfy those load, those current needs for our system. Now, a second model that we bring to the table is the thermoelectric generator dynamic model. In this case, the thermoelectric generator or tech can convert thermal energy into electricity based on the Seebeck effect, where the power output depends on the temperature difference. This will happen is that you will have a junction to a heating system and a cold junction to a cooling element that is possible to re to retain the excess of energy produced by a system in electric energy. The model that we propose is a very simple. It's just a straight line. It's just the voltage for a thermoelectric generator is equal to the open circuit voltage of the thermoelectric generator minus the open circuit voltage of the thermoelectric generator multiplied by the current of the thermoelectric generator divided by the short circuit current of the thermoelectric generator. In other words, it's a straight line. If we multiply voltage by current, we have the power. If we divide the voltage by the current, we have the impedance. We can see the behavior of the system. More than that, if we take the derivative of the power with respect to the current, we can calculate the optimal voltage for a thermoelectric generator, the optimal current for a thermoelectric generator, and the maximum power for a thermoelectric generator. Very simple. For a thermoelectric generator, always the open circuit voltage divided by two will be the optimal voltage. The short circuit current divided by two will be the optimal current. And the maximum power will be always the short circuit current the, up, the open circuit voltage divided by four. Very simple. And now we can demonstrate very simple using the mathematics and this type of model. Here, the thermoelectric generator, what we did, we were validating this model with one of my students, in this case, for the thermoelectric generator and to comparing with other IAB curve that were presented in the literature. He took a paper from the literature and my student was comparing, as you can see, the first plot that say voltage versus current is by one article with one of the authors. And at the same time, in the bottom, you can see our model and they are sufficiently close between one and another. But the good thing is that we can extend the word similar to the PV curve we only limit to the IP curve or PV curve, but if we want to obtain a behavior of the power with respect to the impedance, or for example, the power with respect to the current, now we can see those type of curve. More than that, we can use it for different type of application like circuit analysis, renewable energy application, among others. Something to mention, it is that there is a relationship between a thermoelectric generator and a solar panel. The worst solar panel that you can have at the end will behave as a thermoelectric generator. So it's something very interesting. So that is the type of behavior that we can see it in this type of IB curve. And if we take, and you remember the fractional exponential model, if N was equal to one and Q was equal to zero, we have the same equation for the, I, for the thermoelectric generator. Let's go to our third model that it's called the fuel cell dynamic model. In this case, for the this fuel cell dynamic model, we develop a relationship of the open circuit losses, ohmic losses, concentration losses for a fuel cell. We propose the following model that the voltage is equal to the voltage at the low level, equal to the difference of the voltage at the high level the low level and the following function that we can obtain the behavior of a fuel cell. In this equation, we validated our model using an experiment here at UPRM with the value from the, uh, the electrolyzer. We were able to do this experiment compared with our model. In this case, it was a fuel cell interconnected to the boost converter and our electric load. And we can see the behavior of the dynamic system. More than that, using the chroma that we have it, we were able to emulate the behavior of a fuel cell, modifying some of the parameters inside of the chroma that we were able to at least to force to emulate the, the chroma as a fuel cell. And we can see the behavior of a fuel cell under different contrain. That's something very nice because again, we can see not only the IB and PV curve, but also other type of behavior for the renewable energy system. 
we can apply for hybrid system. In this case, we have an example that we did with one of our students that we have a hybrid system. PV with fuel cell, DC-DC converter interconnected to a DC converter and load. This load, it is just an electric motor. And in this case, we were able to control the speed of that motor and at the same time supplying the power from the PV and the fuel cell. In this case, we were able to develop the dynamic model for the fuel cell, for the PV, for the maximum power point tracking DC a speed motor, and we can see the behavior of the fuel cell at different power and at different angular speed. In this case, for the motor, the angular speed was in green and we were able to control this hybrid system. So again, we can use those kind of model for hybrid system. That's another thing. Right now, we are working in the model for a non-ideal battery. In this case, what we wanted to do, not only to consider the battery as a constant voltage source, no? Let's take the battery as the normal behavior, something that is changing with respect to the different amperes idle or cycles of, cycles of operation of the voltage. And we are working in this model using Simulink and comparing with the literature and the model that we have, that the type of work that we are working that now we can use it for multiple DC source interconnected with this, this storage, inverters, and AC load, for example, in the case of grid forming inverter. At UPRN, we have a setup that we have the chroma simulator with TV inverter, digital power meter, and electric load that we are able to test those models, not only from the theoretical point of view, but also to see and explore how they will behave to validate those values. In this case, we have the general model for a PV interconnected to a DC to DC energy storage. In this case, the energy storage on ultra capacitor, the inverter, and an AC electronic load. Here, we are able to develop the dynamic model of the system, and we can see how it's running. And at the same time, to emulate that dynamic, we can extend that work. If we have more than one system, for example, you have PVEs, but also you have fuel cells, maybe you have batteries and how they can be here. You have those dynamic distributed energy systems interconnected. And now we are able to describe the dynamic model, the dynamic equation, but also to develop maximum power point tracking strategies and using these dynamic model for the behavior of the system, even any type of load that we have here, they're connected by a transmission line. So now we can analyze the behavior of multiple inverter-based resources, transmission and distribution network using different kinds of inverters and different type of hybrid DC sources. So see, can, we can see the dynamic behavior on the DC side. And that's something very nice because now we don't need to assume that the renewable energy sources are current sources or ideal batteries. No, they have a dynamic behavior. And now we can see this work. We have been working in collaboration with Sandia National Lab that we are using the, the exponential phase look, look lob photovoltaic model for power hardware in the loop application that we are using my model for the exponential model, the PV hardware PV inverter, the real one, and we can use it, uh, the work at Sandia National Lab that is validating a silver, single hardware PV inverter with multiple interconnections of this system. As part of this work, we are able not only to control the power from the DC side, but also for the power that is sent to the load. In this case, this connection, as you can see in the simulated distributed circuit of the test bed that is used at Sandia National Lab. Actually, during the summer, we send several of our students and faculty to collaborate in this type of project in the joint collaboration between UPNM and the National Laboratory. Finally, other applications that we have it, we are not limited only to the part of the research, but also we want to train and to develop the next workforce of engineers that they know about energy systems. In this case, we are using grid forming inverter as a research tool for students. We wanted to attract undergraduate students in these topics. And one of the ideas to teach them about our models 
related to PV fuel cells, thermoelectric generators that the student, they run a grid forming inverter system interconnected and is able to control the power and the PV more than that. This work we published it as part of the EDU9 conference of the IEEE the last March in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, we have a very good reception because probably was one of the first work of few works in the area of grid forming inverter for application purpose, not research, just for educational purposes that we were using. And um, we were training undergrad students in this area. Finally, Another work that we have been working here is the using the design of a three-phase multi-level inverter using PV at a source. In this case, we are using the fractional polynomial model interconnected to a boost converter to a nine-switch multi-level inverter. And the intention is that we can control the maximum power and the power that is provided by the PV, but at the same time, we can satisfy the load, the depending the power that is needed by the load. Here you can see the example of the run of the system that we have been doing and that part of the work that we have been doing at UPRM. So in summary, different dynamic models were introduced for various energy systems, including exponential, fractional models, for photovoltaics, model for thermoelectric generator, fuel cell. We have been uh, right now a work in progress model that is for non-ideal batteries. At the same time, we show different applications and implementation for research and validation purposes. And one future plan of the research area will be in the area of grid forming simulation and more application for validation purposes. So here are some of the references that we have been using. All of those work, you can find it at the IEEE. We publish at the IEEE Photovoltaic Special Conference, the Power and Energy General Meeting, and other conference that we have. So with that, I conclude my presentation. And if you have any question, I will be more than glad to answer the question. Okay. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for the interesting presentation.